Ralph. Hello. Hello. The title of these talks is Breaking the Boundaries. And I'm wondering, do you have a view about that? What do you think about that? I have a, certainly got a view of it <laughs> because I couldn't understand the title because it doesn't apply to me. I never had any boundaries, so I wasn't aware of the fact that I was breaking anything. I have an intuitive, instinctive feeling towards the work I've been doing, and that is not a considered decision. I have never in my life, in the work in the theatre, made a decision. Everything I've done has been intuitive and has come from the imagination of what I felt like doing. So I wasn't aware of the fact that I was breaking a boundary because I never had a boundary. When I entered the theatre, it was intuitively, it happened by chance. Everything in my life has basically by chance and any talent I have is recognizing the accident when it happens and then pursuing it. Okay, I think that's a really important thing that you've said, is recognizing the accident, because that's quite hard to do, isn't it? Well, yes, I think that I have said it previously on other occasions, is that all my work has happened by accident, and I because I've come across the accident and the talent that intuitively I appear to have <laughs> is to recognize the accident when it happens. Okay. You suddenly found an old paper clipping from 1955 55. when you were doing uh, Tannhauser. Tannhauser at the Royal Opera House. Exactly. And I'm going to quote this to you. I'm reading it. And it says, by the third run through of Tannhauser, you had made up your mind to throw tradition out of the window. Well, I'm astonished. I was astonished when I came across this interview and I was astonished to read what I've said because I have not changed anything. What I said in 1955, 60 odd years ago, is exactly how I've conducted my life and work in the theater. I simply worked the way intuitively, instinctively, I felt I wanted to work. Okay. You have described, however, yourself or your work as being abstract, haven't you? A abstract is a word no, that you have used. No, I've never actually described my work as being abstract. It's other people who... Oh, I beg your pardon. It's other people who have defined my work as being abstract. I never thought of it in terms of abstraction. What I have done is to create an environment helpful to the performers because the most important thing for me was that the audience concentrates on the actors or the singers not on my setting and my the greatest the greatest help i have the greatest pleasure it gives me when i realize that the performer be it a singer or be it an actor is feels content within the space that I have provided and that gives me the the greatest satisfaction and on occasions when it has happened that actors or singers have actually thanked me for the space that I've provided for them that has been the happiest moment moments one of the happiest mm. moments in my work. Well, I I do know from actors that I have talked to that they love 
working in the spaces that you create. So um, you're quite right about that. But now, uh, uh, before we talk about the productions in detail, which we will do, I just want to ask you to talk a bit about the spaces that you create, because I think you're in your head, you're staging a whole production, even though the director that you're working with may not be aware of how you're conceiving the space and that staging. Well, it all starts naturally by reading the play or listening to, to the opera. And the happiest, satisfactory period of my entire career in the theatre, which is now extends to 67 years and something like 250 productions, has been that directors have never ever said to me what they wanted me to design. They have always said, we're going to do Hamlet, go and do it. <laughs> and so I would then design in my mind, I would create a space of my own direction. And I would then treat that with a focus, which is the most important, the focus on the performers. And the, the best results are when I feel that the actor or the singer feels content within the space that I have provided. And that is how intuitively I have worked. And wonderfully, throughout my career, when I've handed the model over to whoever the director was, they have invariably said, thank you. Well, of that's course, a miracle. Of course, they could then see their own direction within the space. They could not possibly see my version, but they could see their version of the, within the space. And to be said simply, thank you for handing it over, was the biggest, happiest, not happiest, the wrong word, the biggest satisfaction to me, just to be told, go away and do it, and then handing over the work to be said, thank you. Well, I think that's a very good description of your work process. I mean, an example is, I think it's behind me, is Die Soldaten, exactly. which I did for Ken Russell. And that's a perfect example because we are going to do this Bernd Zimmermann production of Die Soldaten, Les Soldats, The Soldiers in Lyon. Go and, go and do it. I just want four acting areas. That's all he said. He didn't say what the subject was. He didn't say what the, the nature of the piece was. I, listening to the music, I realized it was the, the raping and mistreatment of women by the military at the end of the 18th century. So it was sexually orientated. So I did, but all he said to me, go and do it, I want four acting areas. I didn't have the f slightest idea how he wanted to use the four acting areas, but I knew that I had to design a, a sexually feminist, sexually oriented setting for it, into which, in such a way, that it gave him four acting areas. Okay. Well, my piece of sculpture <clears throat> has four distinct spaces. And when I handed him the model, all he said was, thank you. The whole setting was very feminist oriented. And I had a center section. It was very three-dimensional. Yeah. And I knew perfectly well that during the entire production, the audience wouldn't want to look for two, two hours at two white breasts in the center of the stage. 
but it was the image and I used the white breasts image as a projection screen for images throughout the production. And therefore, when even though the breasts were actually very three-dimensional, I seem to remember it was something like from five to six feet in depth. But I knew that as soon as projections came onto it, it would flatten out into a white screen. I want to um, add something to what you said because the stage in Lyon where you did this was is very wide and what I remember is that these it was a broken torso in three parts. Correct. Yeah. And it filled the it was very well placed in scale in this very wide theatre and the scale was enormous because even on the maquette I can remember the people were very small yes appeared to be can you remember actually how big the whole piece was well if, well not in terms of meters now mm. I can't but um, it was a very Lyon was a very deep and large stage so it was possible. Um, well, I mean, naturally, any production that one does has to belong into the space that is available where it happens. Lyon was very convenient in terms of my design, and therefore I related my design to the, to the space. Throughout my entire career, Space it varied. You could be, I could be asked to do this production of De Soldaten in a very small space, in which case the design would have been a totally different type of design that fitted the available space. I think um, looking, as I look at your work, and I know your work, I think you always E instinctively respond to the space and just on the other side of me here is a is a picture of as you like it oh well the, as you like <laughs> it is quite a story in itself was it uh, 1967 was as you like it correct at the old vic correct and the old vic was then the national theater run by Laurence Olivier. Correct. Just because briefly tell us the story. It all started off by Laurence Olivier asking me and Clifford Williams, the director, to do uh, the, as you like it, as best Shakespeare or contemporary by Jan's by Cot. Jan Cot. Jan Cot. Yeah, yeah, yes. Jan Cot. Jan and Cot. I read it and I said to Clifford Williams, who was asked to direct it, I said, I don't want to do it. I'm not interested in Jan Cott's theories on Shakespeare or contemporary. I don't want to do it. <laughs> and he said, I don't want to do it either. <laughs> so it was Kenneth Tynan, who was the manager at the time at the Old Vic Theatre. Which was who, the National Theatre. Who, who Theater. had talked Olivier who was the most wonderful actor, but not very intelligent. He wasn't a very intelligent man, but Kenneth Tynan was the manager and he was intelligent and he talked Olivia into it. And both Clifford Williams and I said, we don't want to do it. So it didn't happen. And after six months, I had an idea. And I said to Clifford, I've had an idea. Why don't we treat it like a dream? And in a dream, men can become women because they're dreaming it. And, and therefore, I thought we could do it. If we can put it to Olivier, we'll do it. But forget about Jan Kopp. And let's do it that these actors are playing women. Olivier took it up. And we did the production. And I, in my 
thinking the Forest of Arden became my own Forest of Arden. Don't let me explain how. It was because the idea of women as men dressed as women and the whole thing being a dream, the Forest of Arden could become anything that I decided as an artist, not a theatre designer, as an artist, artist. Mm. I would create a stage. And Derek Jacotivy, as Touchstone, walked in with Ronald Pickup and Charlie Kay as Rosalind and Celia into the space. And the first line was, it was Derek Jacobi saying, so this is the forest of Arden. Well, of course, there was a juice guffaw from the audience because my abstract setting for the forest of Arden was my version. And of course, it did, it had the character in the abstract, but it created a laughter when Derek Jacobi has touched them said, so we are here in the forest of Arden. But it got, it got it all going. Well, I was in the audience as a very young student and I remember when Derek Jacobi said, so this is the forest of Arden, you remember a laugh but I remember a gasp at the beauty of it because what we saw was a forest made of transparent <coughs> perspex rods hanging down. And what, if I may say, going back to our earlier conversation about space, the National Theatre at the Old Vic is essentially a um a vertical space as opposed to Lyon, which yeah. is a horizontal space. And these transparent rods that made the trees uh emphasized the height. Am I right? He, yes. Yes. But it was subconscious. It was a feeling that I had I was just doing it the way my mind made me work. I never ever in my entire career had I made a conscious decision other than to create. And basically, I've discovered after 65 years, I'm basically an artist. And theatre just happened to turn out to be the area in which I worked. I could also have become a sculptor, but it didn't work like that. Um, uh, and I could have worked, had my life started differently, I could have been a sculptor in the nature of Anthony Caro. I can today relate myself to the work that Anthony Caro did, and I could easily have gone in that direction, but that was not the way it worked. It worked towards theatre. I would like to um, say to you that I think you're a very great artist and you apply your art to theatre, but you're an artist, Ralph, through and through. So just let's not argue about that. 65 years later and 250 productions later, yes, I must be an artist, but I, think so. I never, I never, during, in the course of those 65 years, I didn't think of myself, I'm an artist. I just thought of myself, oh, tomorrow I've got to do this production I've been asked to do. Okay. So, Ralph, I'm thinking way back, a long time ago, when you were asked to do a stage film of the Fritz Lang movie, of Metropolis, which is actually set in a worker's factory. Right. And going to f an o to a um, car part. Um, it was like a dump, I think, where old bits of cars were. Well, it was a breakers, a, a car breakers, breakers yard. yard. Yes. Can I went to visit because I wanted to find 
cogs because there were two societies, an upper society in the manner in the manner of Donald Trump and the lower society working <laughs> underground. And therefore um th- th- that was I found I have to find cogs, interwoven cogs. And what I went to a breaker's think? yard to buy a gearbox in order to find the gears. And of course, when I opened up the gearbox back in my studio, I found that the inside of the gearbox was so interesting as a structure. I thought, this looks like a working place for workers who work in a foundry or who work in who work in 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 metal in in constructing whatever they are because that was the nature of the look and the appearance of the inside of a gearbox once taken apart you will see that i have the two inside halves of the gearbox and left and right of the stage and i linked it together with a walkway, a metal bridge, linking one section across to the other section of my gearbox. Well, Metropolis was a society divided between the people in control and the people working. And what my set was, was actually the workplace of yeah. the, the metal workers below stairs. And when I needed to have the head of the organization, the actor whose name I've forgotten now. I had a ladder. He climbed up that ladder to the very top in order to make a speech. And the reason I did that, what I wanted to show the audience, he is at the top of the ladder speaking as a leader of the organization. I isolated him above all else. It was done in the Piccadilly Theatre in the centre of London. Do you remember? I remember the Piccadilly Theatre, yes, yes. Yes. And actually the set was so heavy that they had to reinforce the stage. Do you remember that? No, I don't remember it, but you've reminded me. Um, And it was just... Look, the reason I don't remember it, it wasn't anything of as a very special feature for me because because there's always a situation of one kind or another in any production that one does and one deals with the situation and there has to be something very special for it for one to for me to remember afterwards and supporting the underside of the stage because of the weight wasn't anything at the time very special. It just had to be done. I want to um, move on a little bit now. Here we are in your farmhouse in France talking about your work, not breaking boundaries because there are no boundaries. And there are no boundaries to the number of spheres that you have in your house. I think you told me 72 spheres that you have collected. Is that right? 72? No. no? It's not right. Oh, it's, tell me. It's not enough. Oh. It's 72 that a couple of years ago I counted them in my sitting room and it was 72. I, but in actual fact, I've got Monirel to 300. Okay, so um, I'm going to remind you now, I've had many experiences knowing you, um, but I'm going to remind you now of sitting in the auditorium at the Royal Opera House when you did the production of The Planets. Right. Okay, and we, I can tell you, the audience gasped when they saw a huge sphere appear on the stage. Now, I can't imagine how you had it made. 
but can you talk a little bit about what the construction of that well, it perfect... Well, basically, it was, it was uh, a maker for the work in the theatre called Stephen Pyle, who made it. And I can't remember now how he conceived the actual, I think, I forget now what, it was something like three meters it across. Was three, it was yeah, three It was meters. very big. Yeah. And uh, there's a photograph of me sitting by it, and I'm quite small. <laughs> and I was, yeah. I was stunned by mm. the, the skill with mm. which he constructed the framework for the sphere. And it was uh, treated in fiberglass by some ex by assistance of Stephen Pyle and some ex some students of mine actually clad it in in fiberglass and textured it, and then he Stephen got a finish on it with in 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 in, in a plastic solution, and he got it to be a totally perfect semi-glossy sphere and I thought it was a, a most wonderful achievement mm. and t to me it was the equivalent of doing, of a surgeon doing heart surgery it was just truly amazing you've had always um a very good relationship with the people who have interpreted your work yes and that's been really very interesting and I'm thinking now about the mirrors that you've used and the technique that you developed with the makers of linking the panels together so that we couldn't see where one panel stopped. Well it was, I mean my, it was intuitive like everything in my work has always been intuitive the reason I used mirrors varied from one situation to another, as in the case of um, Twelfth Night, for instance, I just, which is a landscape, the reason I used mirrors in that is to make the landscape look bigger by having reflections. And this piece of white sculpture is simply to say, Greece. We are in Greek territory. And that is just the image for the audience, Greece. And in order to proceed with the production and the relationship of the longing that Orsino has for Olivia, I distanced them and had Orsino downstage right and, and Olivia upstage top left playing the piano with Orsino as far away as possible on the opposite side on the stage floor, looking up at her, admiring at, at her and wanting her, and she was playing the piano. You see, I, I can remember that image. When I talk about this, I can remember that image. And actually, most people, most directors, want those two actors to be close together. If music be the food of love, play on, and you imagine they're right next to each other. And you did completely the opposite, didn't well, you? Well, because in my way of thinking at the time, he couldn't make contact with her, and he wanted her. So I put them as far away on stage as possible, until, of course, as the play developed, then naturally the story then turns play as a development. Olivia doesn't remain up in the air. Well, no. Of course <laughs> not. But it was the starting point for me to tell the audience there is a longing and a distance from one to the other and the play will tell you how it changes. And of course, Olivia finds her way onto the stage and the togetherness subsequently with Orsino. I mean, that is a very good example 
of you staging or directing the production in your head. Can you just talk a bit about your work with Charles Wolfe and the plexiglass panels, how you developed that technique? Well, I happened to meet up with Charles Wolfe when he first took over the company in the 1950s, which was Talbot Designs. The company had been called the company that was working in plexiglass and perspex. It was in those trees that you were referring to earlier, and as you, and as you like it, those trees were actually the very first job in that material Absolutely. that Charles Wolfe did when he took over the company. Absolutely. And I think you have said exactly what I wanted you to say, thank you, which is you were always looking for new materials. You were looking for new ways of using new materials. So you're interested in the quality of materials, aren't you? Well, yes, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't looking. I, it happened. It happened, there was Charles Wolfe, there was plexiglass, there was the ability to create long tubes that can remind you of trees, that can be turned to look like trees. Hence, that's how my forest of Arden came about. It was my subconscious way of creating the forest of Arden. So I wanted to create a kind of mystery. And of course my mystery was my abstracted forest. So um, I want to pick up on your word looking and finding because here we are in uh, Foncluse and you have um, made some wonderful artworks from things that you have found, have you not? Can you describe a little bit the first well, things that you found? Everything in my life has happened by accident and my talent has been recognising the accident when it happens. Yes. And I've never looked for an accident, I've waited for the accident <laughs> and the accident that happened was that I acquired this property in France, a barn, and in that barn I found a lot of old rusty iron was standing about leaning against the walls. I converted everything into living accommodation and my studio, where we are sitting now, was a cow shed. Well, I changed it all into what what it now now is. But nonetheless, rusty old metal was still leaning up against the walls. And all that happened for my subconscious nature and unconscious in nature of the work I did for the theater. The rusty metal simply became an extension from treating theatre work in an abstract way. It became from abstracted environment for the actor towards total abstraction. My work now in the sculpture you are referring to is simply a, div a further development from theatre, opera, stage, abstraction to total abstraction in the form of my metal collages sculptures. So my final question, or my final, um, let's say, recollection, is then how we relate that abstraction to the most wonderful Simon Bocconegra and your very recent work. So I would uh, very much like to you to describe your idea for Simon Bocconegra, which uses your found object 
and the plexiglass we've just talked about. Well, so these two things in your life come yes. together. Well, in reading the play, or reading the opera, in thinking about it, essentially, it immediately was obvious that we were dealing with two societies. I was, we were dealing with a proletarian society in conflict with a patriarchal society. So there were two societies. And I decided to evoke a setting which distinguishes the physically, visually, the two societies. So that's where my bit of rusty metal came in. And that is, because of the rusty metal we talked about on the farm, I thought in my model I can use a piece of rusty metal to to show the working class, the proletariat, and the plexiglass, which, as we've talked about, I've used a hundred times in other productions, could evoke the upper echelon of society, the patriarchal society, as opposites, the two societies. Well, when I picked up my piece, a model-sized piece of rusty metal, I thought, well, when that is six meters tall by five meters fifty wide, it, I got to do something because it won't look like rusty metal. It looked like a piece of scenery painted brown. So I thought I need to use my acetylene cutter to cut a, an abs to cut an irregular groove through the metal, so that. It looks like metal and not like a piece of scenery painted brown. So that's why I made the cut to make it clear to the audience we are dealing with rust. And then the opposite, it's at the opposite end, the patriarchal thing is to do elegance with, with cornices in plexiglass and structures and doorways and openings of elegance is the opposite so to show the, to, to to convey to the audience we are dealing with two societies at the opposite end of the spectrum so um to conclude this when i look at simon bocanegra and also the repetition of it in the three figaros that you've just done or the reference to that, not the repetition. It feels to me like the rusty metal that you found and the use of it and the plexiglass are like the two halves of your life coming together in one perfect abstraction. Yes. How um, about that? I think, I think it's sort of now, 65 years after I first started, I can start thinking about it. Of course, I never thought about if what do I do, why do I do it. It was work that I wanted to do, that I enjoyed doing. It so happened. So it's really, I had a half century of the most wonderful experience of work in my life and that it just happened to be so. It could have been something else, but that's how it was. Well, you know, I can only say on behalf of the world, thank you very much. And thank you for talking to me. Okay. And thank you for me being with you. And I'm sorry, not physically, I miss you, but that is the best that my Physicians allow me to, to be. Well, to be continued. Thank you. <laughs>